Hi. 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 I'm good. How are you? I'm well. It's nice to see you. Yeah. So I'll just start by introducing our interview. So I'm joined by Alexia. So welcome to Reset Revolution. Today we'll be talking about climate solutions beyond capitalism. And this is something that I don't know much about. So I'm really excited to hear your ideas and your perspective on it. So could you just start by introducing yourself, maybe a bit about where you're from, if you go to school or anything like that? Yeah, thank you for having me. First of all, I love all the interviews y'all have done in the past. Um, so great with that. Um, so my name is Alexia. I use she, they pronouns. Uh, I'm here in Austin, Texas, where I'm from. Um, I actually graduated from college two years ago, so I'm 22 now, and I've been working full time in the environmental justice space. That's great. So could you talk a bit about your involvement in the environmental justice movement and also what motivates you to be involved in it? Um, yeah, so I guess I first started kind of in the climate and environmental space um, five years ago, kind of more in the mainstream movement. There was a lot of um, strikes happening. Um, I, you know, since high school, you know, been involved with like the sustainability clubs and I was involved in kind of policy and the legal aspect of um, the space, but actually encountered a lot of problems with the space. I think just like a lot of racism was happening, a lot of sexism. Um, because, you know, in the US and in other parts of the world as well, the environmental movement is still very predominantly white, mm -hmm. um, which is how I actually kind of found environmental justice. I was really lucky. Um, in 2019, I started uh, my intern with this organization here in Austin called Poder, um, and they're a grassroots environmental justice organization. They're indigenous led and have basically worked um, in the past to combat some of the environmental racism that was happening here in Austin. Um, so mm -hmm. like in the 90s and early 2000s, they were able to kick out um, some major international oil corporations that were, you know, were causing a lot of issues in the community um, and still continue to organize you know, around climate justice, around environmental justice. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started organizing with them, um, which was like a beautiful experience to just be able to learn from such amazing organizers. Um, and then I later also co-founded um, my organization, Start Empowerment, with a friend here um, to basically promote environmental justice education because we saw, you know, the gap in education where there was really cool environmental education happening, but none of it was focused on environmental justice. Mm -hmm. um, and so since graduating, I've been working for both organizations. So um, I've been working for Poder. I do a lot of research, policy work, and then just on the ground organizing. Um, and then for Start Empowerment, I actually write all the curriculum that we implement in our different school partners um, and work with teachers um, to make sure that students have an understanding of social and environmental justice. Wow, that's really impressive. That's great. Yeah, and I think we're going to get into environmental racism a bit later. Mm -hmm. But since this interview is about climate solutions, could you talk a bit about why you personally and many other people believe that there need to be climate solutions beyond capitalism? Um, yeah, so I guess um, I'm going to like share my definition of capitalism kind of to start us off. So capitalism is basically this economic system that is based on the accumulation of capital, which is wealth, right? And it's done at any given cost. So oftentimes you see the exploitation of people, you know, the exploitation of the land, again, with the end goal of just accumulating as much wealth as possible. And so for me, I was really lucky to, you know, be able to learn under some really cool professors about kind of this, the system of oppression and how capitalism functions. And at the end of the day, in this economic system, the goal will always be wealth. And therefore, the well being of the land and the well being of the people is never prioritized. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we see that happening kind of, you know, the rise of the Industrial Revolution, um, capitalism, and, you know, the current society w which we live in, which, you know, we have a climate crisis because yeah. corporations are constantly prioritizing money over anything else. Yeah. Um, and we know that, you know, corporations are largely responsible for this. I think the data is like 71% of CO2 emissions are, you know, created by the top 100 corporations, which is a really, you know, striking fact. Yeah. Um, and so for me, it's understanding that that system will never prioritize the well-being of land and the well-being of people. And then looking beyond that system and looking at some indigenous practices and different traditional practices from like countries all over the world and how they have been able to, you know, sustain themselves and live with the land for thousands of years in a way that, you know, is not leading us down the path of like this climate crisis. 
And so that's why I really truly believe that, you know, in order to have a climate solution, we have to shift away from capitalism, we have to shift away from prioritizing the wealth of, you know, a very few people um, that are, you know, extremely wealthy, and we have to prioritize the well being of the planet and the well being of the people and we have to reshape our entire relationship um, to the land Mm -hmm. and to other people and to community. And do you see that as being a viable solution in countries like the U.S. that are so deeply capitalistic? Um, I mean, I don't think it's going to be easy to get there, but I don't think there is another solution. I think if we don't drastically change the system, we're just continuously heading down the path of worsening climate crisis, which is mm-hmm. what we have you know, seen since the onset of the climate crisis. There has been so many conferences, you know, countries have come together. We recently had COP26 mm-hmm. and it's a lot of talk and it's no action because again, the corporations are still constantly trying to build wealth and we see new pipelines being built, new fossil fuel corporations, you know, new plants being built. Um, And so, yeah, I don't think it's going to be easy to get to that alternative, but I don't think there's another solution. I think we're either going to, you know, head down continuously worse climate crisis or we have to create systemic change. Yeah, I completely agree. And you've sort of already explained this, but I was going to ask you what this alternative looks like. So you've already sort of covered this, but Uh, what particular steps do you think countries can take to change their system? Yeah, Um, so I guess when it comes to alternative to capitalism, I think that's, you know, a very big topic. And a lot of times people have a lot of different opinions as to what that looks like. And I personally don't think there is one correct solution. Um, I think that it's going to have to come from different local systems, right? What might be a good fit here in Texas might not be a good fit in another country or even in another state. And so I do really think it has to come from the grassroots and it has to come from the community. And it can't just be like, you know, some someone comes in and is like, we're going to make this change tomorrow. Um, So I really think it has to come from the ground up. It has to come from communities figuring out sustainable systems that work for them. Um, And I think I think if you look back at history, again, at some like a lot of indigenous practices, there are very hyper local systems um, Mm -hmm. that work very well for the community that are also sustainable that are not, you know, based on the principles of capitalism. Um, And another example that I want to actually bring in is called La Villa Campesina, and it's an international um, peasants farmer basically movement. Um, And a lot of what they do is like reclaim basically like try to create food sovereignty by reclaiming the rights to land, to farming. Um, And instead of, you know, this, this um, corporate agriculture system we're in where people, you know, produce this one crop to sell it, they're basically encouraging people to, you know, build um, farms and farm for their own community and having Mm -hmm. that hyper local system where the workers are, you know, in control of the production um, and all of that. And I think it's been a really inspiring movement. And obviously, you know, the, our food system is a huge part of, you know, the climate crisis because of how much, um, CO2 it emits. Um, and so I think it has to, you know, it has to be shift like that really to the local community and really come from the ground up. Um, and figuring out what these alternatives look like. And I think it's both, it has to be both like a mindset shift in terms of like how we operate and what we prioritize. And then, you know, seeing those changes in practice in terms of like who owns the means to production, you know, who is benefiting, who is making the profit, um, who has access to the resources and the wealth and all of that. Yeah, and I think that, um, that, change being centered around local communities, I think it's really crucial, but it's also very difficult because of rapid globalization and because of how interconnected these large organizations. Yeah. So on a more personal note, what are your, what are your fears uh, and what are your hopes for the future of the planet? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it really depends on the day. I think especially, um, so I guess my personal organizing theory is to both work within the existing system, like use the tools that you have available. And that's why I do work in like policy and the legal realm, Um, but then also organize outside of the system. So really build community power, you know, mutual aid networks and all of that. So I do engage in both of it. And I think 
it can be very frustrating. Um, I know currently here in Austin, we're dealing with a lot of issues from aggregate mining operations um, and the TCEQ, which is the um, Texas agency that's supposed to regulate. Um, regulate industry is uh, not doing a good job in any shape, way, or form. Um, and so we're actually trying to get rid of, strip, strip their power and get the EPA Region 6 to step in. Um, but I think just like on a local level, like a lot of work that is being done, like you see a lot of opposition, I think, especially in Texas, um, <laughs> compared to some other states. Um, and I think that's really frustrating. I definitely have days where I don't necessarily like am that hopeful for the future just because of where we are right now. But I think at the end of the day, like hope is a practice and it's something I try to like incorporate in my life. Um, and for me, it's like the little the little moments with like community members or like the really small victories or just seeing even someone like shift their perspective or their relationship to the land. And I think little things like that give me more hope. And then also knowing that there are so many amazing organizers that are, you know, so passionate and like caring about this issue and doing something about it um, really inspires me. And then also... Um, I'm really lucky to like be able to learn from some elders who have been in this movement for like the past 40, 50 years. And so it's really inspiring to see them, you know, continue to the, do this work despite all the challenges and the strength that they carry. And I think that also inspires me to make sure that I continue to practice hope and like keep going and fighting, you know, for the people and for the planet. Wow, that's a really interesting answer. Yeah, from I mean, I think for a lot of people, including for me, it's really difficult to stay hopeful when there's just, especially in the mainstream media and the news, there's so much negativity being thrown at you. So I think it's great that you look at hope as something to practice continuously. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Something that you talked about at the beginning of our interview, environmental racism. Could you elaborate on that and just explain why certain groups of people, ethnic, racial groups are affected more by the climate crisis than others? Yeah, so I'm gonna first talk about it in the US because that's kind of the context that I know. Um, So I guess in the United States, I think especially in the 60s, there was a lot of research and studies that came out to really show that um, basically polluting industries were placed next to communities of color and that the number one determinant of how much pollution you were gonna be exposed to was actually race. Mm -hmm. Um, And so in the United States, there's kind of like a history, obviously, of like extreme racism and like redlining, which is um, how the zoning in basically cities and states were created, where, you know, communities of color, especially black communities were put in these like redlined area that, you know, were considered bad by the government. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the polluting industries were placed next to those communities and, you know, face, um, you know, all the health issues that comes with living next to those industries. So like extremely high cancer rate, respiratory issues, and a lot of people dying from, you know, from this extreme pollution. Um, Mm -hmm. And we still continue to see that, you know, today um, in the way in the way which industry is located in the United States, um, which is kind of how the entire environmental justice movement came to be was, you know, a bunch of organizers of color that, you know, realized um, that the mainstream community, the mainstream environmental community at the time didn't necessarily care that they were living next to these industries that were, you know, that they were really suffering the health consequences of living next to them. And so they kind of came together to write the environmental justice principles and kind of found this movement in the US to address environmental racism and to try to relocate those industries and then also um, you know, have bigger climate justice goals. Um, and so that's kind of a little history on the movement in the United States. And then looking at it on a global level, you also see you know, the global South being disproportionately impacted by, you know, by the climate crisis crisis, um, by extreme weather events and all of that, even though historically, if you look at all the emissions, um, the global south has least contributed um, yeah. to, you know, global emissions that have, is causing the climate crisis. Yeah, and then definitely, and then inability to adapt to that, like in the US, those people, those people of color in the low income areas are often unable to pay for health care the, to deal with the, the health repercussions that pollution. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think so much of these issues, these climate issues are really intertwined with race and ethnicity and live. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And I mean, I've learned a lot. I hope everyone else watching has. It's great to hear you talk about your own experiences and all the great work you're doing. So thank you so much.
Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And if anyone's interested, Start Empowerment has some educational resources on that. Um, so you can check that out at our website. And then the other org I work with is Poder that is doing really cool work. Um, if any of y'all are in Texas. Um, and thank you again so much for having me and for this great conversation. Thank you. Bye. Bye.